yeah. after the temple destruction, after the destruction of Jerusalem, they want to, they pick up his message and then they kind of use that version of Christianity because that's the only version of Christianity compatible with the modern day. But yeah. yeah I get the impression that it's first century Palestine and first century Rome. If you contextualize first century Rome, what you realize is if you look at it from like the Roman pagan angle, what they're doing, they're very heavily leaning on the sun god Apollo. So the sun god Apollo is a predominant god in the first century Palestine, in the first century Rome, sorry. Um, Nero, he was very into the arts. So he, um, he naturally associated with the sun god Apollo because the sun god Apollo was the god of arts. So Nero would like really heavily emphasize on him. Nero was the final of the Caesar dynasty. So then the next dynasty that comes is in the Flavians, which, are, which is the ones I'm talking about. They also are very heavy on the sun god Apollo. So Nero commissioned a statue of himself. Vespasian, Titus and Domitian, they turned that statue into the god Apollo. Um, when Vespasian, Titus and Domitian, when they issue coinage, they issue coinage with Apollo's sacred symbols on it. So they issue coinage with the Apollo dolphin and the Apollo anchor. The Apollo anchor represents the ring Zeus proposed to Apollo's mother later with, which had an, an anchor insignia on it. So the figure Apollo is very heavy. There's a very heavy emphasis on the figure Apollo in the Roman world at that time. Um, Apollo is known as being the son of God. So Zeus is the big God in the Roman pantheon, right? And you have Oh, well, it was the Greek pantheon. The Romans adopt, you know, you're Greek, right? So yeah, you yeah, know that. Yeah. So yeah, um, like Zeus was the big god. Um, Apollo is known as the son of God. So he's known as the son of God. He's depicted in a lot of ways as the ways Christians depict Jesus today. Um, to, and also, so that's one thing going on, right? That there's this figure, Apollo, the sun god Apollo. He's the major figure and the major god in the Roman pantheon at this time. If you go into Jerusalem, um, the emperor of Vespasian, when he goes and does the Jewish revolt, he demolishes Palestine. He's going into the temple. When he walks into the temple, the most prominent rabbi of the time, Yohanan ben Zakkai, greets him and says, you are the mighty king that was prophesied in Daniel. In Daniel 9, I think, or Daniel, I'm not sure which Daniel, but... Me to check. No, it's fine, it's fine. You can check after. Okay. But he says, you are the mighty king that was prophesied in Daniel. At that exact moment, a messenger comes from Nero to Vespasian and tells him, Nero has passed away, You're, you can become emperor now. So Vespasian uses this moment in his life. It's a very shocking moment. He's just, you know, won his massive battle as a general. And at that exact moment, he's told he can become emperor. He had to fight three other emperors, but he becomes emperor in the end. So he uses this moment in his life to kind of become a lot more accepting of Jewish thought because the rabbi is telling him, you are a mighty king, right? So he becomes very accepting of Jewish thought in this exact moment. And that's why his later family, a lot of the women in his family convert to Christianity because becoming more open to Jewish thought and Christianity at that time was seen as a form of Judaism in the Roman world, right? So what I'm saying is, if you look at the context in Rome, there's a heavy emphasis on this son of God, Apollo. Yeah. If you look at the context in Jerusalem, there's this heavy emphasis on Romans trying to appropriate the religion of the Jewish people. Paul pitches an Apollo-like Messiah to the palace. And whatever purpose he was doing that for, I'm not 100% sure, I'm not gonna lie, but it just seems to work because He's combining both those things happening at the same time and he's pitching this figure. And sure, it doesn't succeed in his lifetime. He gets assassinated by Nero, but he pitched that idea in the palace and in the New Testament, it talks about say hello to my friends in Nero's palace, in Caesar's palace. So he has those Christian connections in the palace, which is recognized in the New Testament. That seed he planted blossoms into, you know, these early saints in, um, in the Flavian dynasty as well. Could you possibly show some references to what you've just said so, much, so far. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll show you. Oh, yeah. I'm a Muslim, so I can't like quote every okay. Christian, but I'll try and find the passage here. Yeah. And you guys can fact check me, I mean, if you want everyone. Like, everything. Cool. I was a bit sharper with my references a few months ago, but. Um, I 
I think it's um, Philippians 4, 20, chapter 4, verse 22. Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. I've got it here as well if you can't find it. I'll wait for you. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus, the friends who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of the Emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That's the end. Uh, yeah, so he's saying all the saints greet you, especially those in Caesar's household. So that shows he has a connection to Caesar's household. That shows there's Christians in Caesar's household. So I'm saying there's an infiltration of Christianity very early on in the imperial household, which is the Roman Emperor's household. Why do you think it took so long for the Roman Empire to, the Roman Empire to eventually adopt Christianity? Because, you know, I think 1312 is when, yeah. what's his name, Constantine has his, he sees, 30, yeah. he sees the, he has a vision, and then he, he converts to Christianity. So actually, what I'm proposing to you guys is, in the first century AD, the Roman Empire could have had a Christian emperor. If you look into the Emperor Domitian, um, who is the third of the Flavian dynasty okay. um, after Vespasian and Titus, so he's Vespasian's son. The Emperor Domitian, he, he doesn't have any children, so he's childless. He has his niece Dolmatilla, who is a Santa according to the Catholic and Orthodox Church, who the Catholic and Orthodox Church recognize as being the Emperor Domitian's niece, by the way, so this is in the church tradition. The Emperor Domitian, he doesn't have any children. He promises Dormatilla that her two children will become the next in line to become Roman Emperor. So, often... Do, do you know where, did you show where in the church tradition that the Catholics are not uh, I mean, I, I, I can... Uh, it's going to be quite a long thing, but he, he searched it up. It, it, it does happen, right? Well, here's the thing, right? Yeah. That she's recognized. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah, I'm not sure about the rest of it, but I know she's a saint. Yeah, so, about the yeah. specific aspect of he, her being a saint and her being recognized as the niece of the emperor, that is recognized in the tradition, I, I believe. What I'm also saying is, um, the emperor Domitian doesn't have any children. He promises her children to become the next in line to become Roman emperors. Um, one thing that was often recognized by the early church was that her husband, Domitilla's Dom husband, was also a Christian and she, he's recognized as being a Christian martyr. It's not 100% sure what his identity is, I'm not going to lie, but he's often associated as being Clement of Rome. So, it's very interesting that some of the early church, some of the early church recognized that Clement of Rome, the first church father, almost had his children become Roman emperor, which is shocking to me. Oh no, you're not debating. We're just talking. Oh no, 16. Oh, we're just discussing ideas. Yeah. Why are you debating a 16 year old? I'm not debating, Christian I'm not debating, talking. Well, I'm just talking you to you. have got a video on, man. Uh, I'm friends with this guy. I'm friends, friends with him. I'm, I'm, I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna. You shouldn't be just talking to somebody. Why don't you talk to me? What, what's the, is he, what is he talking about? I talked to you, I literally talked to you when we talked last time. Did he not come up to me and then I talked to him? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. But, but you're putting him on camera. Yeah, we don't have to put this. Are we happy to put whatever? Like the early yeah, questions, was there any issue? I mean, we're, 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 just, we're just talking ideas. What's the, what's the issue? I'm not. I'm not like him. I'm not like. Don't worry. I'm not. I'm never going to be no, like him. I will never attack your position. I'm just here to spread. Not. Like, I get the impression yeah. you're not really testing me. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just asking you questions. Of course, so. of course. Yeah. And of course, like, of course, you probably don't. Disagree, you probably disagree with a lot of what and I'm also, saying. But I'm just. I'm just happy. And also, do you know what the EPQ is? The EPQ. The EPQ. No, no. Essentially, uh, I get to. I get to write an essay on a topic of my choice. You know. Oh, EPQ. Oh, from like yeah. school. Okay. Yeah, cool, and I'm writing cool, it on. Cool. Yeah, the possible impact on, I guess, Christian views on social yeah. roles or hierarchy, something like those two points. So, oh, very I, interesting. I, I am reading up a bit on the possible, so this is quite interesting to, to read on. So, That's good. Yeah. And just on, um, yeah, we're definitely happy to explore that in a minute. Um, with the Emperor Domitian, he, um, so he promised Dormatilla's two children to become Roman Emperor. The reason that didn't happen like, so obviously that didn't happen, right? We didn't have a Christian Roman Emperor in the first century AD. The reason that didn't happen is because um, Domitilla actually, he started to get very paranoid, Domitian. So he started to get paranoid of all of these various groups in the empire, including Christianity. So he killed Domitilla's husband and he banished Domitilla to an island. And because of that, Domitilla became very bitter towards him and sent an assassin 
which killed Domitian. And the night before his assassination, he recognized Domitilla's hosti hostility against him. So he said, um, Dom Domitian, when he had that paranoid moment, he switched back to the old gods. So he switched away from Apollo back to a god called Minerva. And he says, on the night before his assassination, when he recognizes Domitilla's turned on him, he says, the hand of, a hand of Minerva cannot protect me from the hand of Apollo, which is a very interesting quote for me because he's associating Domitilla, who's a Christian, with the god Apollo, which is the god that was there before and which was the god under which Vespasian and Titus worshipped and didn't persecute Christians under. So for me, it seems like there's a connection between early Christianity and the god Apollo and maybe Maybe like the Roman Empire seeing Christianity as being a Jewish version of this Apollo and being like some kind of sect of Apollo. And maybe that's why Catholicism, by the word being universal, trying to make a universalized version of their God Apollo by trying to include the Jewish Empire. So, so, so you don't think that Paul was like intentionally doing this, but you think he was adopted by... I'm, I haven't, this is something I'm like looking into yeah, okay. and it's because you're looking into it now as well for your EPQ. For me, Paul, Paul is just like, something that's just really interesting for me is you have these like very Torah Orthodox Christians, like Christians that are practicing in Jerusalem, like James the Just, the Church of Jerusalem, then being very practicing of the law and stuff. Paul was persecuting these Torah Orthodox Christians, right? I went before, before he converted. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah. And that, on the road to Damascus is where he converted because he was trying to... Yes, to me, it he just, was a witness to the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Yeah, to me, it's just really interesting. Like, I feel like he doesn't, like, there's this massive change of heart he has, right, in Damascus. Yeah, For me, it doesn't feel like that. It just feels like he has the same... Like, he's persecuting these Torah Orthodox Christians. Then he has this event in Damascus happen. Then after this event in Damascus, he... He just turns this religion of Christianity very Torah light. So is he really having a change of heart or is he just like fulfilling the same mission he had all along? And he's just, he continues like, you know, like he doesn't suddenly shift to a Torah Orthodox message. If you he, think he's trying to infiltrate the Senate, you think That's like one thing I, I feel like yeah. he might be doing. Another thing I might, I feel like he might be doing is he's recognizing the Jewish revolt happening in his homeland, um, in his people's homeland, right? He wants to kind of, um, in combating that, he wants to kind of, um, he wants to have a more pacified version of Christianity in order to protect his people. That's another thing that could happen, right? That he wants to save his people from persecution. Um, he recognizes the Roman Empire is very hostile on the Jewish people. He just wants to create a very Pauline Christianity, which is compatible with the Roman Empire, which can last. And that's why I believe like gospel writers, they're very Hellenized Jewish Christians. Yeah. After the temple destruction, after the destruction of Jerusalem, they want to they pick up his message and then they kind of use that version of Christianity because that's the only version of Christianity compatible with the modern day. But yeah. yeah I, I get the impression that, however, that the idea that Paul kind of dies as a martyr yeah. implies that he has some sincerity and I don't think he dies as a martyr willingly regarding something you think is false just to kind of infiltrate it from the inside. Like, Could it, let me propose a different version to you. It might yeah. be crazy, but Paul dies around 66, 67 AD. Just before, just before the Jewish revolt, right? If he was a Roman agent who was sent to pacify Jerusalem and Palestine, if he was that Roman agent, he was killed by Nero, right? He was called to the palace and then he was killed by Nero himself. Not himself, but like in the presence of Nero. Maybe he was an unsuccessful Roman agent and because the Jewish revolt happened, was starting to happen, He's called, he's called to the palace. He's like, you had one mission, which was to pacify these people. You failed in your mission, so we're gonna execute you. Could that also be another version? Or is that too crazy? Yeah, I think it's, it's a bit hard to kind of visualize. Because it's very interesting, he's killed just before the Jewish revolt. Because I see Paul as being a person who, I think I mentioned this earlier, who could have had a very comfortable life, you know. He could have been a member of the St. Egen, well-educated, yeah. literate, but I think, um, he was a student of Gamaliel who was kind of really highly revered in Judaism. I think there are even, I guess, texts which refer to the Rabbi Gamaliel talk about how good he was and how after he died, all things went badly. Um, yeah, I think he could have left a led a kind of comfortable, successful life and instead he chose to travel across the entirety of the Mediterranean. He was part of a shipwreck, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
he he's eventually beheaded. You know, it seems like, like a very like a very a tough livelihood. You know, basically living you know paycheck to paycheck, not paycheck to paycheck, but you know, struggling. Um, Josephus talks about this figure. I think it's Saul of Agrippa, Saulus of Agrippa, or something. I can follow up with you later, but it's um, some people have linked that figure that Josephus is talking about to the figure of Paul in the New Testament. And the way Josephus talks about him is this figure was um, causing mayhem in this region and stuff like that. So, yeah, and he was seen as being a descendant of a Herodian descendant, like so, descendant of Herod Agrippa. Um, so it's not it's not like a confirmed thing, but like it's a very interesting thing that you can look into. Is Agrippa like a locational term? I think so. I think so. Uh, there's Her Herod, right? Like King Herod. He's known as he's known as Herod Agrippa. In Roman history. No worries, no worries. But yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully. Is there any other questions? Or, I mean, it was really nice talking, man. I really enjoyed. Just a few more, like. Yeah, sure, sure. What, what makes Christianity more appealing than, I guess, Islam? Oh, uh, Christianity. No, no uh, sorry. What makes Christianity more appealing than, kind of the, what was the present kind of religion of the Roman Empire, which was, I guess, inclusive polytheism? Because surely, you know, the way it works is you conquer territory, yeah. taking their gods, and then everyone's happy. You know, you can easily assimilate these people. So, um, the Romans like the Greeks before them, so Ptolemy, the Ptolemaic Empire, I always get that name wrong, um, Ptolemy um, II or the third, he, when he conquered Egypt, he incorporated the god, um, he incorporated the god Osiris into their pantheon, the Greek pantheon, and he created a new fusion god called Serapis. Um, the, so that happened before the Roman Empire. The Romans with the, you know, the, they had these issues with the Persians. The Persians had a god Mithra. They kind of created Mithra as a figure in the Roman pantheon, which is kind of a fusion, you know. That wasn't religion, it wasn't in the pantheon, but it was like a new religion, right, competing against Christianity. What I'm saying is, like, the Romans, like you said, they had a tradition of whenever they conquered an empire or whenever they're at war with the empire, trying to win, beat that empire, and then take one of their gods back to their pantheon. They did that in every war. The one war they didn't do that in, from my understanding, is the Jewish revolt. And what I'm proposing is they did that with the figure of Jesus. So they took Jesus back, like Isa al Islam, the figure of him, back into their pantheon and they turned him into one of their gods. But instead of turning him into a new god, they just adopted their god Apollo to become more Catholic, more universal, and kind of distribute that religion through that way. And you had this like um, really, throughout early, this period of the Roman Empire, you had this like competing Mithraism and Christianity were two religions that were constantly competing in the early Roman Empire, right? The reason I believe Christianity won out is because Mithraism was a religion of the enemy. So, you know, the Persians, the Romans were always yeah, at war with the Persians. Always. They were like the number one enemy, right? All the way to the end all the way to the end. So they wouldn't want to start worshipping a religion which is based off their enemies' gods. Christianity, sure, their main figurehead is from Palestine, from the Jewish people. But the Jewish people are like a backwards people to them, right? They're like a very primitive people. And they're a people under their empire. So what's the issue? They saw Christianity, the reason I feel like Christianity won out against Mithraism is because Christianity is Sure, it's a foreign religion, but it's a religion of the empire, of a subordinate people in the empire, a religion of a weak people in the empire. They would choose that religion over the religion of Mithraism, which is a, a religion of a strong people who are the enemy. So that's why, you know, you mentioned like Constantine, why did early, uh, Christianity win out in the end? I feel like the reason it won out in the end is because Mithraism became such an issue and Christianity and Mithraism were competing that the Roman elite started to realize the issue and then they started to shift away from Mithraism because traditionally Mithraism was a religion of the Roman elite and Christianity was a religion of the poor. And the, I think eventually the, the Roman elite started to realize Mithraism is not a good idea when you're constantly at war with the Persians so we should kind of back Christianity and that's why, why I believe like Christianity won out. What do you think about the pacifism of Christianity and how yeah. How that kind of may contradict the Roman Empire's idea of warfare, you know? Because I know, I know initially Christianity was all pacifist, and then yeah. once Constantine adopted it, he did then turn Christianity into kind of a 
more, more military. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't Saint Augustine write about a just war or something along those lines? But yeah, like isn't Christianity like inherently a pacifist religion? Yeah, and I feel like it's an inherently pacifist religion because I feel like the fundamentals of the religion were established during the Jewish revolt. So I feel like because you had that threat from Jerusalem at the time and Palestine at the time, Christianity was very early spawned to become a religion of pacifism in order to quench the Jewish revolt because the Romans saw the Jewish people as like who were inhabiting those areas like the Pharisees and these kind of people, they saw them as extremists and they saw them as a threat to the Roman Empire and then when they established that Jewish state, amazingly they established that Jewish state very early on in the Roman Empire. Um, yeah, the Romans were like shocked. How did these backwards people adopt, like, defeat us? So then they kind of, yeah, they kind of done all sorts of propaganda against these people. One of the forms of propaganda is taking a religion from that region and turning it into a very pacified religion in order to like quench that thinking and stuff. Um, yeah, I don't see the message of Isa alayhi salam in the New Testament. I, I don't see the message. Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, was a poor. Galilean, right? According to the New Testament, yeah. he was somebody from Nazareth, a very poor area in Galilee. Um, when Jesus comes back from um, his time with John the Baptist, he comes back to Galilee, right? He comes back to Nazareth, and he sees Nazareth. When he comes back, he sees Naz Nazareth Hellenizing. He sees all these Hellenized cities popping up around Galilee, and the whole economy of Galilee starts shifting towards accommodating these Hellenized cities. And he, if you look at the New Testament, he specifically preaches along the Sea of Galilee, avoids these Hellenized towns popping up around Galilee. He preaches to these poor fishing villages, right? And the fishing towns where he wins all these apostles, like, um, you know, his early apostles. Um, he specifically preaches in these areas, away from these Hellenized towns, when he could easily preach in these Hellenized towns. He specifically always avoids certain terminology to be associated with the Messiah, he uses the Son of Man more often. The Son of Man also, it's kind of, it's kind of similar because, you know, that Daniel 7.14 refers to the Son of Man. I can try to find the verse. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Son of Man, I don't necessarily see it as being something that implies he... Sure. Oh, I'll just carry on while we find Um So yeah, I'm saying, um, I see him as a poor Galilean preaching against the Hellenization of like, I mean, according to the New Testament, you can even see glimpses of that, like preaching against the Hellenization of the area, preaching against, um, preaching against the authorities, right? Like we all believe that Jesus was a figure who was up, who was against the authorities. That was his message. Like the term son of man doesn't kind of, doesn't mean that he can't be, you know, the Messianic figure. No, absolutely, I agree, I agree. Yeah, but I'm saying, I'm saying he, the reason he chooses that terminology more often is because he's avoiding the title Messiah in order to like, you know... To the Jews because they knew that referred to kind of... No, no, because... No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm yeah. saying he is up against the authorities. If he uses, blatantly uses the terminology Messiah, he's going to be crucified. Because anyone who is a, up against the Roman authorities gets crucified. So he in order to continue preaching his message and avoid persecution from the Romans, yeah. he uses son of man more often. That's why I'm proposing that he uses that terminology more often because if he uses Mount Messiah outright, they would just get him. Because every time there was a messianic figure in that time period, they would crucify him as a bandit. And crucifixion was reserved for bandits. And bandits in the Roman Empire were people who were up against the Roman state as a form of sedition. So he, in order to avoid that happening, he would use the Son of Man, but he was yeah. he had the same purpose as that. Right? So bandit is a term, what is it? Lestai. It's Lestai in Greek, I believe. Or yeah. Have you heard that? Lestai? Like, what does it mean like, in English terms? Or what bandit, as in like a, a criminal. Okay. A criminal and yeah. crucifixion in that time, if you look into it, um, in early Palestine, slaves as well. yeah, um, in early Palestine, crucifixion was used by the Roman Empire in order to um, persecute bandits who they saw as committing acts of sedition, which is going against the empire. I'm saying, like, and when you when you look into the figure of Isa al Islam, Jesus in the New Testament as well, he goes up into the Temple Mount, right, and then he goes up with a massive amount of followers, and then he goes to the money lenders, he flips the temple the tables and the money lenders, whips them. So he leads a massive movement of people to the high, te uh, to the high temple, right? To the Jerusalem temple, 
attacks the Jerusalem temple by like releasing animals, whipping everyone. That was a common practice in that time. Messianic claimants would lead their people to the high temple and then attack the high temple. He was doing that, right? So he, so what I'm saying is that every, yeah, so he was doing, he was basically claiming to be Messiah by doing that, right? By, by kind of doing that. And yeah, in a sense that he, he didn't like the fact that they were using it for, I guess, trading. Why? Who are the people who are put in authority in the high temple? They're put in authority by the Romans. The, the Jewish government at that time was subordinate to the Roman government. The Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin right? The Sanhedrin yeah. were all puppet leaders of the Roman government, weren't they? Uh, if you look into it, every single one of them was a puppet leader of the Roman government. The poor Galileans and people like, you know, from the ilk of Jesus, they recognized that. They wanted to fight the authority, which the authority was puppet leaders put in stored by the Roman government. So what happens is... How do we know they were puppet leaders at the same time the Roman government was, I guess, destroying the temple and persecuting the, the Jews? They were puppet leaders because um, the Roman... Okay, I'll tell you one reason. The, there was a Roman eagle on top of the Temple Mount. So like the Solomon's Temple had a Roman eagle on top of it. So that was to show that these people are subordinate to the Roman Empire. As part of the, the um, you, you know when they perform sacrifices every year during Passover, I think. Um, I think it was over Passover. They would specifically bring in Roman shields and then they were told to perform a sacrifice for the Roman Emperor at the time. Of course, any practicing Jew would never do that. Like any, I mean like any true authentic practicing Jew at the time would struggle with that. But the Romans had the authority to like appoint whoever is the high priest at the time. They, they, were, liter they were literally puppet leaders in so many ways. So yeah, Jesus coming into the, high into the temple, basically attacking, vandalizing the temple was a show of opposition against the high priest to show him I am the authority of God on earth, not you, right? And that high priest was put in charge by the Roman Empire. So it, him vandalizing the temple is not just in opposition to the high priest, it's in opposition to the Roman Empire at the time. The, um, a few days after that vandalism, um, I'll, I'll quickly wrap up if you need to go. Um, a few days after that vandalism, some of the Jews go after him and they say, um, you, you know, um, we, have a coin, we have Roman coins, which have figures of the emperor on them, like the head of the Roman emperor at the time on there. Do you advise us to use these coins or not? Are you familiar with that story in the New Testament? And then, um, so basically at that time, some of the strict Jews, they were reluctant to use Roman coinage because they saw Roman coinage as a form of idolatry because they had the head of the Roman Emperor at the time. Um, so there was that dispute going on. And also, they were trying to catch out Jesus because Jesus literally attacked the temple a few days before, right? So they're trying to catch him out. They're trying to say, you know, what's your thoughts on like Roman coinage? And he says, give back to Caesar what's Caesar's, give back to God what's God's. If you look at the Greek, it says, give back to God what's God's. So he's basically saying, give back, Reza Arslan interprets this as, give back Jerusalem to God what's God's. So he's basically saying, they're trying to say, are you a zealot? You went into the temple, you destroyed sorry, sorry, the temple. Sure. Me, I, I just need off uh, clarification sure. on something that I said. Yeah, what sure. was the question they asked him? Um, the about the coin, coin like, um, you know, you know where he says uh, it's about the coins and it's about... Um, what was the question they asked? Sorry, could you confirm what was the question they asked? Get back to the conversation. Yeah, no, it's fine. Don't worry, man. Get back to the conversation. Yeah, I'm basically saying that you can look it up later. It's about, you know, the, the passage where it's give back to God what's God's, uh, give, give to Jerusalem, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and give to God what's God's. It's about that part there. The question was, Yeah. So no, actually, the question that I asked him was, should we pay taxes Yeah, who should we pay taxes to? Probably, yeah. But it's about the coinage, it's about the coinage. If you look into the contextualized, if you contextualize it at the time, it was about whether they should use Roman coinage or not, because Roman coinage was an issue at the time, because... Yeah. Which is why Jesus requested the coin. And then it says, whose signature is that? Is this? Yeah. And it said, it's Caesar. And it said, give unto Caesar, that which belongs to Caesar, give unto God, that which belongs to God. Yeah. And when I'm saying... The original when it, question was on taxes. Okay, okay. Okay, sorry. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Sorry. Yeah, I might... I might I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of still the point, right? So what I'm saying is when he says give back to God what's God's, he's saying that um, give back Jerusalem and Palestine to God. So he's basically, 
he attacks the temple. These two Jews come up to him after and they say, they're trying to, on behalf of the Roman Empire, they're saying, are you a zealot? Are you someone who opposes the Roman Empire? He confirms that by saying, give back Palestine to God, what's God's. And then a few days after, that's when they capture him and then they try and crucify him for sedition. So what I'm saying is, the message of Isa Islam was always in opposition of the authority at the time. And that's why the authority at the time was the Roman government. So you see what I'm saying? Like, that the, I don't see the message of Isa Islam as being a pacifist religion towards the Roman Empire. Uh, as these guys later made it. That's it. So, so you think that like, the Roman Empire utilized Christianity to as a form of propaganda to the Jews? And you believe that the absolute fathers were kind of agents of Rome? Yeah. So do, do, would you agree that they knew the disciples or not? So they were all agents of Rome? The early church fathers were like I'm saying, the earliest church father, uh, apostolic, the earliest apostolic church father is a member of the Roman imperial household. I mean, absolutely for this plural, so... Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if, if for me, if the earliest member of the chain is got that connection, I can't trust the whole thing, right? And also, it's very interesting for me, like, when you look at the disciples, like um, James the Just and all of these people, a lot of them are being crucified for sedition as well, so they're being crucified for sedition. Sedition is in opposition of Rome. So what I'm saying, what I'm proposing is the disciples, which we believe were Muslim, and Isa al Islam, which we believe was a Muslim, we believe Isa al Islam was saved from crucifixion, right? But that was his destiny, right? According to the narrative. Um, what I'm saying is, these people are getting eliminated very early or disappearing very early, and then suddenly the authority shifts to Rome, to these apostolic fathers, who are based in the city, which is the headquarters of the Roman Empire, which is the religion against. I'm trying to go. Sure. So, so where is so you, you, you had the bishop, you had the bishop say Jerusalem. Right? Yeah. 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 I need to go. I need to go. I, 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 I need to head to pray in a minute. I'm just, I'm just, I was just going to say, like, where do we see the equivalent of the Absolute Fathers yeah. kind of in our perspective, in the kind of Orthodox Catholic tradition? The equivalent of the Absolute Fathers, so the people who need the disciples, who kind of affirm what, let's say, Islam teaches, or, or like a non Romanized Christianity, as you see. Sorry, sorry, repeat that question. Why do all the Absolute Fathers and all the descendants of the original disciples? And the original church yeah. affirm this, what you consider Roman as Christianity. Where, where's the kind of example of opposition to it? Opposition, like within so the church. The opposition to it is the Ebionites. Yes, as were, in, they, were they part of the church? Or were they kind of? So what happened is any opposition in the Roman Empire. Early Christianity was formalized very early, like you're saying, right? And any heretical group to them was persecuted in that empire or in that region in the West and was pushed to the desert, was pushed towards, you know, like the, the borderlands of the Roman Empire. So what I'm saying is a lot of these groups that are the ones you're saying, the opposition, they were pushed out of the empire and they were accumulating in places like Arabia, where we know we have traditions of Christian monks like Warwick, um, like we have traditions of these Christians. So what I'm saying is the opposition was there. It was just heavily persecuted and it was kicked out of the empire to these borderlands and these the desert basically. Like, what were the kind of like the earliest examples we can see of like the Ebionites existing? Um, there's lots of examples. Like for example, um, Paul. Even some con some people believe Paul refers to the Ebionites in the New Testament when he says "gift." I'm um, giving to the poor or something. So Paul is um, synonymous with the word Ebion. So often when Paul refers to the poor, some people see that as him referring to the Ebionites. But yeah, I, I really have to go, bro. But yeah, yeah it was really good nice talk. Speaking you, Great speaking to you. Yeah, yeah let, me, let me know if um, I'm, I'll be here next week as well if you want to yeah. continue. And uh, good luck with yeah, the EPQ. I'll be next week, but a couple of weeks later I should be. Yeah, yeah. So. I've got a channel as well if you want to follow it. Um, it it's uh, just Tay M. Okay. So yeah, yeah nice. in case you want to watch it. Nice speaking to you. Nice speaking to you, man. Take care, take care, take care. So wait, can I can I go your channel? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's a really new channel, so it's not it's not much there. What was it called? Um, so it's just T A Y. T A Y. And then M. M. Yeah. It's nothing on there yet, but I'll start putting up stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah.
I uh, need to head off to pray, but yeah, it was really, really good conversation. We explored a lot of things, um, basically playing off some questions with the young Christian there about why I'm a Muslim. So I explored um, the reasons I'm a Muslim from an internal perspective, from an external perspective, in terms of my innate fitra, and then the beauty of the universe and the fine tuning of the universe. Also, the message of the Quran and how that is the most preserved message from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Um, the, the seerah of the Prophet um, his message, his legacy and his example to mankind. Then we just explored a few things about early Christianity um, that he had some questions on. And yeah, it was a really good conversation. Look forward to speaking with him more. Jazakallah khair for everyone joining.